Okay, in our study so far, we have the flood behind us at this point. Notice how my voice amplifies week after week in a greater and stronger way. And uh, we're now in the new world. You should have your Bibles open to Genesis chapter 9. So far in this chapter, we have covered survival in the new world. <clears throat> chapter 9, verses 1 to 7, uh, the survivors of the flood, which are eight, were to be fruitful and multiply. They're to have respect for human ri- life. They're not to kill people. They're to, they're, they're to survive and then thrive and, and replenish the earth. The Lord holds life sacred, it says. Then the Lord gives them a covenant for the new world, verses 8 to 17. Again, the notes are in the back, two pages of notes. The covenant states that the Lord will no longer destroy the, the world with a flood, and then the Lord gives a rainbow as a sign of that covenant. Then sadly, we discover there was sin in the new world, verses 18 to 27. Noah becomes drunk, and he uncovers himself in his tent, and then his youngest son, Ham, looks upon him uh, in a disgraceful manner, in some way, and tells his other two brothers what had happened, and his other brothers, Shem and Japheth, they choose not to look at their father, unlike Ham, and they walk backward, and they very carefully cover their father's nakedness without looking upon him, while Ham is guilty of shaming and disgracing and dishonoring his father. That's where we are tonight, sin in the new world, verses 18 through 27, but let's start with verse 24. When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. Noah finally realizes what had happened when he sobered up. Now, we're not told how he knew. We don't know. Uh, Probably the first sign to him was that he was naked, and he figured, well, what what happened here? Could be that maybe in his drunkenness he has a vague memory of Ham coming in the tent. I don't know how that works, and uh, that's possible, I guess. Uh, Maybe his two other brothers told Noah, uh, the two sons of Noah told him, Shem and Japheth, hey, this is what happened with Ham. He showed you disrespect. Whatever happened, once he was rid of the influence of wine, his head's clear. He has something to say in regard to his sons and something to say in regard to their descendants. He first utters a curse. Look at verse 25. What does verse 25 say? It says, cursed be Ham. Is that what it says? It says, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brothers. I said that on purpose, by the way. First of all, who is Canaan? Well, verse 18, go back to verse 18, it says he was the son of Ham. Verse 22, he's the son of Ham. Those are two ominous warnings about what's ready to happen. Look at chapter 10, verse 6. The sons of Ham were Cush and Mitzrayim and Put and Canaan. And then Noah picks out the fourth son on the list, Canaan, and he says, cursed be Canaan. Now, why is the son, here's a question, why is the son of Ham curse. Wasn't it Ham himself who disgraced his father, who dishonored his father? What had Cain, the son of Ham, done? By the way, the time frame here is after the flood. Chapter 10, verse 1, the the last phrase says, these are sons born after the flood. And uh, the sons, and, and how many years after the flood? I don't know. It doesn't tell us how many years after the flood. But still, Cain had done nothing to disrespect his father. At least, we're not told of anything. But Ham did. Now, why didn't Grandfather Noah say, cursed be Ham? Cursed is it's a strong term. It's, a, it's a, uh, a, a word, you know, calling down misery upon people. And in this case, calling down misery upon uh, his grandson, Canaan. Some future in store for Canaan at this point. Doesn't the Bible teach that the son shall not suffer for the father's sin? Doesn't it say something like that? Deuteronomy 24:16. Fathers shall not be put to death for their sons, nor shall sons be put to death for their fathers. Everyone shall be put to death for his own sin. That's what it says. Ezekiel 18, 20. The person who sins will die. He's going to pay for his sins. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. So why does Noah say this? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us doesn't say anything about what the reason is. It doesn't say, well, you see, the reason Noah cursed Cain and not Ham is because of such and such. It doesn't elaborate. doesn't say anything at all. People have debated it for centuries as to the why of what happened. Jewish rabbis have speculated again and again. It all comes down to speculation and that nobody really knows. But I, after all these centuries, it's come to me, the answer's come to me, 
And I'm going to reveal this to you tonight, or not. Uh, I really don't have a conclusive answer to this, but let me offer a few possibilities, a few things for us to think about. First of all, I believe in the light of the context of Genesis 9 through 11, 9, 10, and 11, Noah is looking down the road to future generations and their relationship to the Canaanites. You know, as you read Joshua and historical books, you're going to read all about the Canaanites. You know, Joshua's got to go in and wipe out the Canaanites. They're bad people, God says. This is not just about the person Canaan. It's also about his descendants. The Canaanites are going to be enemies of Israel. And I also think verses 26 and 27 of Genesis 9 also take the long look. Now, there's a Jewish commentator by the name of Casuto. His name was Umberto Casuto. Sounds like a Spanish first name to me, Omar, and a Jewish last name. He says, by the way, Casuto, considered to be a great uh, commentator on Genesis, I read, uh, got to chat. He was sickly or sick, and he got to chapter 13, verse 5, as he was writing the commentary and died in the middle of writing the commentary, is what I read at least. But let me just tell you what he said. So he didn't get far into Genesis. Kasuto says, future generations of Canaanites, they're the enemies of Israel, they would be conquered, and I quote, they'd be conquered not because of the sins of Ham, but because they themselves acted like Ham, because of their own transgressions. They would not be cursed because, Canaanites would not be cursed because of the sins of Ham, but because they themselves acted like Ham, because of their own transgressions. I have to wonder if, Canaan was, if Canaan, the grandson of Noah, was old enough, did Noah see similarities in Canaan as he did in Ham? I don't know if, how old he was. I have no idea. Maybe he did. But could it be said that the Canaanites acted, that when so, in some way would act like Ham? Yes, I think it is. The difference being Ham saw the nakedness of his father, I think deliberately, not accidentally. He saw his nakedness, whereas the Canaanites actually committed Forbidden acts of immorality. The wording is different in Leviticus 18, by the way, than it is here about this. That's a, another story. But they actually committed acts of immorality, incest, in many cases, uh, and uh, whereas Ham saw only saw with the sight. They did it in a great way. But as the old saying goes, what the parents do in moderation, the children will do in excess. Scary saying. In Leviticus, Leviticus 18, the Lord instructs Moses to tell Israel this, Leviticus 18.3, he says, do not do what is done in the land of Egypt where you lived at one time, nor are you to do what is done in the land of Canaan where I'm bringing you. Don't do what those guys did, what those guys are doing. Don't do that. What was done in the land of Canaan? Well, read Leviticus 18 and 20. You say, I don't want to read Leviticus. You're going to see a connection here if you read these, those chapters. There's a lot of discussion. In those chapters, about not covering, uncovering the nakedness of your relative. And he goes on to name every relative, it seems like. Don't look upon them while they're naked, don't, which means don't violate them. In this case, in Leviticus, through their immorality, don't do that. And uh, by the way, Ham did not uncover his father's nakedness. He looked upon him that way. Noah did that. The Canaanites would be guilty of sins like that and much, much more. In fact, they're going to break records for sinning, the Canaanites, quite honestly. They're going to act like Ham to a much greater degree. Now, in the 1900s, an archaeological discovery was made in Syria called Ras Shamra. And there's, it's very interesting, but uh, the, the, the discovery speaks of the evil religious and social practices of the Canaanites, very evil, very wicked. And uh, let me just give you a quote. Inscribed baked clay tablets at Ras Shamra, that's the place in Syria, and at other sites have revealed something of the horrible nature of the Amorite religious practices. The horrible nature of the Canaanite religious practices. And tr trust me, they were horrible. Horrible isn't the word to describe these people. They worship gods who have been shown to be sexual perverts of the most grotesque kind. And that was carried over into the lives of the people. So all this talk about incest, because they did all those things. All those things and more. And these gods of Canaanites had no respect for the sanctity of human life. Countless children were sacrificed by, to their gods by being thrown into the fires of their god Molech. This really happened in history. And you read about this in the scripture. Oh, don't sacrifice your children to the god Molech. Why? Does it keep saying this? Because that's what the Canaanites did. Horrible things. And, I, and quite honestly, I can't read you the rest of this. It's very disturbing. 
Very disturbing what they did, especially regarding children. But let's just put it this way. They buried people alive, among other things. It was a horrible, beyond horrible culture. The Canaanites sunk to the depths of depravity. And people say, well, we don't understand why God's so mean and wants the Canaanites to be killed and wiped out. Well, there's good reasons for it. They were, they were uncivilized barbarians, treating inhumanely their own children. Horrible things they did. Beyond horrible things. But as for this idea that Canaan acted like his father Ham, there's an interesting verse in Exodus 20. Exodus 20, verse 5, says, and I have all those verses on the notes. Exodus 20, verse 5, You shall not worship idols nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. I visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Oftentimes, children of godless parents, parents who hate the Lord, they despise the Lord, they want nothing to do with the Lord, the children learn to take the same attitude from their parents. They learn from them, and then they, they teach their own children to take that attitude. And so the children, too, fall under the judgment of God, not because their parents hated the Lord, but because they themselves hate the Lord. Now, they learn from their parents, and that's a horrible thing. But each person is responsible for his own sin. So we can't say, well, it's my parents' fault. The reason I am what I am is because of them. Well, you have to take responsible for, responsibility for your own life. And so that's what happens here. And at any rate, Cain and not Ham is cursed. I tend to think, again, this is not conclusive. I can't prove it. It doesn't even say what it is. I tend to think that Casuto is right when he said, it's not because of the sins of Ham, but because they acted, they themselves acted like Ham. And Noah utters this curse in the sense of a future prophecy. I think it is, at least. Not everybody thinks that. What is the curse? Verse 25 says, A servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. We'll see it three times. Look at those verses. First, the first time is verse 25. Verse 26, let Canaan be Shem's servant. Verse 27, let Canaan be Jephthah's servant. Three times says that. Now, a servant of servants means the lowest of servants, the lowest of slaves, the most despicable of servants. Now, the Canaanites, are, in general, they're going to be conquered by Joshua. As you read through the scriptures, they're going to be conquered by Joshua. Not completely, and the reason is, is because the people are disobedient in Israel. They're not doing what they should. They're not uh, trusting God as they should. They're not taking it to the Canaanites like they should. They don't conquer everybody, and you'll see that pointed out in Joshua and Judges very plainly that they should have. But many were conquered. And to be conquered means you are under the authority of the conqueror, which means, that means servitude. You're going to be a servant to these people. They conquered you. And if you read through the Old Testament, you can see examples of that. For example, uh, the Canaanites being servants. Joshua chapter 9, the Gibeonites. Gibeonites come to Joshua and the people, and they pretend they're from a far distant land, and, and uh, Joshua makes a pact with them, and and then they find out they weren't a far distant land. They were living in close by. These are Canaanites you just made it a covenant with, which you're not supposed to do. And they made an unwise decision there. And Joshua 9.23, Joshua says to the Canaanites, to the Gibeonites who are Canaanites, he says, now therefore you are cursed, and you shall never cease being slaves. Ring a bell? That's the fulfillment of Genesis 9.25, among other verses. Then in, Genesis, then in Judges, there are various references to Canaanites being subjected to slavery. Uh, Judges 128, it came about when Israel became strong that they put the Canaanites to forced labor. Again, they're servants, and you see that in various verses. I have them listed there, and many others. But later on in Solomon's reign, 1 Kings 9, verses 20 and 21, as for all the people who were left of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, who were not of the sons of Israel, their descendants from them, Solomon levied forced laborers. Those people are all Canaanites. Again, they're servants. So, yes, they did become servants of conquered people. And uh, when you're a servant of conquered, when you're conquered by someone, you're in no position to argue the point. You're a servant. But let me also add that this is not, this curse in Genesis uh, 9.25, this is not an eternal curse to condemn people to hell, condemn all, all Canaanites to hell eternally. That's not what he's saying here. 
Because if you recall, one example at least we know of, a Canaanite who became a follower of Yahweh. Who was that? It's in Joshua chapter 2. And that is Rahab the harlot. Rahab the harlot, a Canaanite, became a follower of the Lord. So that's not a curse on them eternally as such. It's a curse in, in other ways. Now, back in the day, years ago, when I was a kid growing up, what, 10 years ago or so? Or maybe before that. I don't, I don't remember how long ago it was. Back in the day, there was a view that was popular. I heard people talk about this view when I was a kid. I heard people mention this. As I grew up, I heard it periodically, and people would say, this, they talk about this view, and I would think, is that what that means? I didn't know that's what it meant. It was said that since Ham was cursed, this is how they put it, Ham was cursed, they would say, and since Ham was the father of black people, therefore the black race was cursed. And you would hear that kind of thing. I heard it every once in a while. It was, it was at one time a, a major view, and the people promoting this view, uh, they said they used this curse in Genesis 9.25 as the reason black people were enslaved in the uh, 1700s, 1800s, and so on. And I read an article recently, on, on, uh, well, uh, this past week, on the subject by Tony Evans. You know who Tony Evans is? Black pastor in Dallas. I, we got to meet at the Shepherds Conference one time, by the way. Tony Evans wrote an article. You can look it up. It's called Our Black People Cursed. You can look it up online and read it yourself. And he said that certain Christians tried to teach black, uh, black, they tried to teach black slaves that slavery was the will of God for them since the Bible taught it, you see. And so they took these guys that were trying to promote slavery. They took Genesis 9.25 and they said, you see there, God has cursed black people, therefore it's, it's right to enslave them. And, and that attempt to enslave African people you know, was uh, insulting, it, was, it, it abused them, it was inhumane, and all because they said, and these people are in the image of God, all because they said, this is what the scripture teaches. But this curse is not on Ham, first of all. It's not on all of his descendants. It's on Canaan and his descendants. Look at 10.6 again. The sons of Ham were Cush and Mitzrayim and Put and Canaan. Cush is Ethiopia but probably covers peoples beyond the southern border of Egypt. There's a little debate about these kind of things. Mitzrayim is Egypt. Put is probably Libya. Canaan has to do with various people who inhabited Israel, Lebanon, Syria. No Canaanites are alive today, by the way. So only one of Can's, Ham's sons is cursed, which is why Tony Evans asked the question in his article, how then could all black people everywhere be cursed? Well, they aren't. And that was a big view. Major view at one time. This servitude only applied to Canaanites. Just to be clear, the Bible does not teach that the black race is to be subjected to slavery. That's a misinterpretation uh, by a long shot. Now, to quote the now politically incorrect children's song, when I was a kid, we sang this growing up. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. He loves all the little children of the world, by the way, regardless of their color. But I will tell you this. All black people, all white people, and all other people are under a curse. It's the curse of sin they're under. And as a result, we are slaves of sin. And in fact, each one of us could be called a servant of servants to sin, if, it were, if the truth were known. Romans 6, Paul says, before our salvation, we were slaves of sin. Romans 6, 17. But now in Christ, we're free, free from that slavery. Now, somebody may be here tonight who's a slave to sin. Maybe it's got you under its bondage. Maybe it has you in its, in its chains. Maybe you can't get free from it. It's only through Christ's death and resurrection you can be freed from that. If you repent of, of your sins, turn to Christ, your hope's in him. That's the only, your only place of hope. He'll, he'll deliver you from this. There's no other way. So Noah first utters a curse against Canaan. Secondly, Noah utters two blessings in verses 26 and 27. First of all, regarding Shem, verse 26, uh, he also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Now, we probably expected Noah to say, Blessed be Shem. See the wording there in verse 26? Blessed be Shem, because he first of all said, Blessed be Canaan. But he doesn't say that. What does he say? Look at it carefully. He says, Blessed be, not Shem, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, is what he says. Now, Noah understands that even as he has just sobered up, he understands and gives credit to the Lord. That's the covenant name for God, Yahweh. Yahweh is the God of Shem. And so that's Noah's testimony, Shem. 
belongs to the Lord. He makes that clear. And Shem demonstrates that he belongs to the Lord by his actions. Did you see that? Verse 23, it was Shem and Japheth who uh, were so careful to make sure their father's nakedness was not seen. It was Shem and Japheth who were so careful to walk backwards to cover their father up, to show respect for their father. And here's the thing. If the Lord is your God, if the Lord is the one who rules your life, then your actions, even the smallest actions, are going to be those that glorify God. You're not going to be perfect, obviously. But your actions are going to glorify God. Matt, I love Matthew 5.16, which we all memorize as kids along with our other song we quoted a minute ago. Let your light shine in such a way before people that they may see your good works and glorify you. Is that what it says? Let your, works, let your light so shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Our lives should be leading people to say, blessed be the Lord God of that person. The emphasis should be on him. We should be pointing people in such a way, it's not on us. Oh, man, Mark, this, you know, uh, Elliot's such a great Christian, such a wonderful Christian. It should be Elliot's God just to be worshipped. That's what we should be saying. Uh, you're, you're, it should be on him, not us. It's a great thing when, people, when you can say, the Lord is my God. That's a great thing. I can say the Lord is my God. It's a great thing. It's a greater thing if people say it about you, the Lord is his God. That's a different thing. It's coming from somebody else. The Lord, it says God. Noah didn't have to wonder about Shem's spiritual status. It was clear to him. I like Psalm 144, verse 15. How blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. How blessed they are. Think about that for a minute. So if the Lord is your God, you are a blessed individual. No greater blessing than to say the Lord is my God. If you have, if you have nothing else, you still have the greatest of blessings. You belong to the Lord. Now, going forward, the Bible is going to make it clear that Shem is in the, the elect line, the chosen line, the chosen of God that leads all the way to Christ. Genesis 11 is going to show this. And then Luke 3. Canaan will serve Shem. I should say the descendants of Canaan will serve the descendants of Shem. Who are the descendants of Shem? They're the Semitic people. Shem, Semites, Semitic people, the Middle Eastern people, such as Jews and Arabs. Of course, the line of, of Shem in Genesis is going to go through Abraham. It's going to focus on Abraham. We're coming into chapter 12 where it's going to focus on Abraham, which will ultimately lead to one born of Jewish descent. Who is that? That's Christ. Something else about Shem I want you to know also, there's been a lot of, in the last year, I've heard a lot of accusations in America about people being anti-Semitic. Have you heard these uh, accusations? And most of them are true, by the way. A lot of comments, even from people in Congress, uh, have said derogatory things about the Jews, and to be anti-Semite means to be opposed to the Jews, to be anti-Jewish. The best known anti-Semite was probably Adolf Hitler, who's known for this. He had over six million Jews murdered. Uh, that word, Semite, comes from the name Shem. To be anti-Semite or anti-Shemite is to be against the Jews. The history of the Jews, is, in fact, is one of facing uh, anti-Semitic peoples, people throughout, study this history of the Jews. People hate the Jews throughout the centuries. They ran them off their land. They got rid of them. They hated them. They killed them. They despised them. Christ himself was despised uh, from people who were anti-Semitic. But still, Shem is the blessed one. And then there's another blessing here regarding Japheth. That's in verse 27. It says here, may God enlarge Japheth. Let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Now, the blessing Noah wishes for Japheth is that God will enlarge him, or make space, you could say, for him. His name means to enlarge. Japheth means that, by the way. Got to make space for Japheth. Why? Because the people that descend from Japheth are Indo-Europeans. That would include Europe, Russia, even India, uh, and people who descend from those places. That's a lot of space. Japheth is going to need to occupy. But, he, but most of us here, by the way, most of us here tonight are descendants of Japheth, um, if not all of us. And then it says in verse 27, let him dwell in the tents of Shem, uh, meaning that Japheth is going to experience a peaceful cohabitation with Shem. If I thought of this illustration, if Shem were a shade tree, Japheth would be sitting under his shade. He's going to enjoy the blessings put upon Shem. And, he's, and Shem is, Japheth is favored because of his association with Shem. Somebody said to reside in the tents of Shem is the same as declaring that Shem's God is also Japheth's God. 
Now, how does this relationship work out in history between Japheth and Shem? How does that work out based on these verses? Well, uh, the answer is not an, an easy one, not at all. Uh, I'm still thinking through it myself. The descendants of Japheth are not dwelling in the tents of Shem in the Old Testament. They're not. But they are in the New Testament. Uh, they're descendants of Japheth, Gentiles, who come to be the true seed of Abraham. Galatians 3.29, if you are Christ's seed, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. You see, Shem's line, as I said, is going to continue through Abraham all the way to Christ. And if we Gentiles come to Christ for salvation, then the promise of dwelling in the tents of Shem is said to be fulfilled. Many think that is the case. Ephesians 2 and 3 speaks of Gentiles becoming fellow partakers with the Jews of the gospel. An older commentator said that the Japhethites have now very largely come in to share tent Shem's blessing. They share Shem's blessings because for the, for the Gentiles have been grafted on the good olive tree. He's talking about Romans chapter 11. The good olive tree being Israel. The Gentiles, us, have come in, wild olive tree, grafted in. In other words, the Gentiles are partaking of the sharing in the blessings of salvation first offered to the Jews. And so the reasoning is we get to share in the blessings of Shem. Again, I'm still thinking through that interpretation, but... Since Genesis 9.27 is above my pay grade, I'm going to move on to the next point. And that is death in the new world. We've had survival in the new world. We've had uh, covenant in the new world. We've had sin in the new world. Now we have death in the new world. Verses 28 and 29 says, Noah lived 350 years after the flood. All the days of Noah were 950 years and he died. Noah lived 350 years after the flood, meaning he lived 600 years before the flood, Totally 950 years. 20 years more than Adam. If anybody could say, been there, done that, it was Noah, right? Old world, new world. Now he's going to the next world to be with the Lord. Noah's family, can you imagine living 950 years? Noah's family may have been pulling for him to, come on, come on, Noah, you got to hit that thousand year mark. You got to hit a millennium. He could have been a millennial, I guess. You got to hit that thousand year mark. You know, we recognize people who live for 100 years. Oh, he had a century mark. And uh, he lived to be 100 years. That's amazing. But to live 1,000 years? Can you imagine? Oh, yeah, I remember back 700 years ago, that guy over there. I remember all that. I can hear Noah now saying, no one knows the trouble I've seen. And that would be true. He could say that. But notice especially with me the last three words of verse 29. Those last three words. And he died. Do, do those words ring a bell with anybody? Go back to chapter 5. Let me refresh your memory of chapter 5. Look at verse 5 of chapter 5. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and what happened? And he died. In verse 8, all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Verse 11, all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Verse 27, all the days of Methuselah, oldest man ever, were 969 years, and he died. We called that the dreary refrain when we were in Genesis 5. The dreary refrain that keeps going on and on. It comes back to haunt us again now, and he died, it says. Kind of the end of chapter 5, you could say, in a way. Where Noah, back, as you go back, as you trace back through the line of Seth as, as well. As I said last week, the more things change, the more they, think they say the same. Noah may have looked like he was going to live eternally on the planet. I wonder if people thought that. Well, Noah's never going to die. I don't know if they thought that or not, but the grim reaper still managed to hunt him down. After 950 years, he dies. Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed unto men once to die. That's just how it is. You can't escape it. Even the righteous Noah, yes, he was a righteous man. Righteous man. Even he had to face death, as all of us will, unless the Lord returns be prepared to meet your maker. And finally, re repopulation in the new world. Repopulation, that's chapter 10. Chapter 10. What do you do with chapter 10? Brian, what do you do with chapter 10? There's a bunch of names in there. Genesis 10 is called the table of nations, called the, or the family of nations. If you're thinking about tracing your family tree back, uh, let me tell you, it goes further back than the UK. You didn't come just from Scotland or uh, Ireland or... Germany or Sweden, some of us here are from Sweden originally, or one of the Hispanic countries, 
uh, or wherever your family history traces your back, your family history can be traced back to Genesis 10. Did you know that? To one of the three sons of Noah. Uh, because everybody in this room can trace their history back to Shem, Ham, and Japheth, one of your relatives. There's a lot of names in Genesis 10 here, by the way. And, and we'll, by the way, we're going to look at every single one, and you're going to like it as we do. <laughs> you know, I happen to know a little secret about most Bible readers. Why? Because I am one. I are one. <laughs> most Bible readers have no clues of what Genesis 10 is about. Why? Because they just skim through, right? <laughs> just a bunch of names. Forget this. And they go on. They skim through it. Too many names to read. Too many names that are hard to pronounce. So most people just skim through it. They skip it all together. Move on to chapter 11. Maybe there's something more edifying in chapter 11, they think. So let me give you an overview of this, just a brief overview to get the general idea. Uh, we're really not going to go through every syllable and, you know, of, of every Hebrew name here. The chapter is divided up into three sections based on the three sons of Noah. So it's not difficult. You have Japheth. Look at verses 2 through 5. Verse 2, the sons of Japheth. And it talks about them, verses 2 through 5. Then you go to verse 6, and you have the sons of Ham through verse 20. Then you go to verse 21, also to Shem. Verse 22, the sons of Shem, and it goes on and talks about them through verse 31. Each section concludes with a summary verse of that particular son. So the Japheth section, which began in verse 2, concludes in verse 5. Look at verse 5. From these, the coastlands of the nations were separated into their lands, everyone according to his language according to their families and to their nations. Then you have the Ham section concluding in verse 20. These are the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, by their nations. You have the Shem section, which concludes in verse 31, which says, these are the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, according to their nations. You're going to notice that each group speaks of their, their languages, right? It says their languages. And chapter 11 says everyone has the same language. So what's going on here? Well, the events of chapter 11 are, they come before the events of chapter 10, you could say. It's not in chronological order. Chapter 11 shows how they got to be, how they got to be like, uh, like chapter 10. So it's, it's not in chronological order. Sometimes the Bible does that. Nothing to get excited about, just how it is. But look at verse 1 of chapter 10. Now, this, these are the records of the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. If you've been ca paying careful attention to our time in Genesis, you're going to recognize the phrase in verse 1. The phrase is this, the records of the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. What is that? We've said it several times. That's the Tola dose, we call it. Or the, what I like to call the built-in outline of Genesis. There's a built-in outline in Genesis, if you haven't heard this before. And we saw it in, you can look up these later, chapter 2, verse 4. We saw another one in chapter 5, verse 1. We saw one in chapter 6, verse 9. These, these are the generations of the history of Noah. Now we see it in chapter 10, verse 1. This is now shifting gears from Noah to the generations of the sons of Noah. And you see that throughout Genesis. That's one way you can track Genesis. Now every detail is not recorded here, but what the Lord considered necessary to further his narrative is here. So it's more selective, not exhaustive. And because these are very ancient names, we don't know... We don't know everything in detail as to their locations exactly. I mean, there's some guesses being made as to where some of these people are from, where their locations are from, who they are exactly. <clears throat> so it's not, we don't perfectly know this because in ancient history, it's, you can't have all the details all the time. It's hard to find out. But let me give you a very brief overview here. First of all, the sons of Japheth, 2 through 5. The order has changed. Did you see the order change back in chapter 5, verse 32? Back in chapter 9, verse 18, look at 9, 18. The sons of Noah who came out of the ark were who? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. What does it say in chapter 10? The order is reversed. It's now Japheth, Ham, and Shem. And uh, Shem is listed last because often in the scripture, when they want to highlight somebody, something, a nation or whatever, they will put the spotlight on an individual by making it the last thing to introduce something else. And here Shem is being uh, highlighted at the end. Now, as we single out some of these names, I'm just going to give you a, a general description. I'm not going to go into every single thing because we'd be here all night and people would be sound asleep probably. Some people are already asleep, as a matter of fact, and hope you enjoy your nap. But look at verse 2, for example, as we look at the Japheth section. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, not Gomer, 
as in Gomer Pyle, okay? What is Gomer? Just to give you a flavor of what's going on here, probably the people north of the Black Sea, meaning southern Russia and Ukraine. Oh, wow, we're starting to see some where it comes to life now. Look at Maidai, uh, also in verse uh, 2, that would be modern Iran. Jabin, that's Greece in Western Asia Minor. Then you go to the sons of Ham in verses 6 to 20. Look at verse 6. You got Cush. I've read that verse already. Cush is uh, Ethiopia. Some doubt, some debate this, or southward around that area of Ethiopia. Mitzrayim is Egypt. Put is probably Libya. Canaan, again, Israel, Lebanon, Syria. Go down to verses 8 to 12. You're going to meet a character named Nimrod. Verse 8, now Cush became the father of Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. We'll talk about him when we get to chapter 11. Go to verses 15 to 18. You're going to recognize some familiar names with the Canaanites. You see those names, like verse 16, for example, talks about the Jebusite, the Amorite, the Gergesite, the Hivite. Where have you seen those names? You see them in Joshua, right? You see them in Judges in those places. Those are Canaanites. They're going to be the enemies of Israel. And here's the first mention of them. And they come from the line of Cain through a uh, line of Ham through Canaan. Then you have finally the sons of Shem in verses. 21 to 31. Look at verse 21. Also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber. Who's Eber? Well, by the way, Shem was his great grandfather. Sometimes the word father can mean ancestor, as it does here. Not always strictly a father. It's usually taken that Eber is uh, the apparent root of the word Hebrew, where many think the word Hebrew derived from the word Eber. Look at verse 25. Two sons were born to Eber. The name of the one was Peleg. For his, his days, the earth was divided. His brother's name was Joktan. And this probably refers to chapter 11, the Tower of Babel, where the earth is, where people are separated and language is confused. And the conclusion of verse 32, these are the families of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies, by their nations. Out of these, the nations were separated on earth after the flood. So, to make a long story short, look at your list. If you have your notes, I, I, I think this came from my AIG. You can kind of get a brief history. I can't vouch for every single one of these names, but this is generally speaking what happened here. From Japheth comes the Germanic tribes and Anglos and Saxons and French and Welsh and Spanish people and Greece, Grecians and Portugal and Poland and it goes on Russia. From Ham comes the Chinese, Egypt. Libya, West Africa, and so on. From Shem comes the Jews, the Arabs, and it goes on. Now, there's some crossover here, too. And honestly, if you really want to uh, study, if you really want to get an honest and just take on Genesis 10, you have to spend a lot of time studying. You can do that on your own. Study and look at all the details, all the names, all the locations, and all these things. You get the idea, though. This, these are the sons of Noah. And from them, the world's going to be repopulated. But I need to ask the question, why is this chapter here? Why is Genesis 10 here? And I think for a few reasons. One, I think it's necessary. The, the appearance of nations and people's groups didn't appear magically. All of a sudden, we don't know what happened. They're here. It's through these three sons who survived the flood. And the Bible is setting the historical context. Sometimes it just flat out has to set a historical context. Not all, you know, people read the Bible and they think, oh, I'm looking for some uh, myth, uh, mythical verse here today. Not mythical, but... Uh, Mystical verse here. Some people might be looking for a mythical verse. I don't know. They, they're looking for a mystical verse, something that makes them feel, you know, flow, they're floating around in the heavenlies or something. But there's a historical context the Bible always sets for events that happen. Why? The Bible happened in history. You have to, have to know that information. Secondly, it fulfills the command of God, chapter 10. Did you notice that? Look at, go back to chapter 9, verse 1. God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And here they are doing that. They're doing it, and God's plan is being carried out. Chapter 11, we're going to find a problem, though. But that's for another, another week. Thirdly, it shows God's lordship over the nations. The Bible speaks of nations throughout its pages. You're going to see nations all over the Old Testament talked about. also speaks of the Lord's rule over those nations. How do those nations get to where they were? How did they get to be what they were? Well, God is in charge of all this. He, he made it happen this way. Acts, Paul's preaching a sermon in Acts, sermon on, the, on Mars Hill in Acts 17, 26. And 
He states this great truth concerning God and the nations. He says this, and God, what a great statement Paul makes here in his sermon. And God made from one man, Adam, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. Think about this. Having determined, God having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. You know, the Lord set the nations in place where they are and when they are by his, that's his design. That goes for all of us here. This is truly our father's world. He's in charge of the whole thing. You, you are where you are and you are living when you're living in the history of the world by God's design. And he has a purpose for you. And that purpose is to serve him and to seek first his kingdom and to do his work. You and be his testimony for Christ. You are where you are. You're born in America because God wanted you to be born here. Loren was born in France because God wanted him to be born there. And then God has you here in this time for this for for such a time as this. This is by his design. Acts 17:27. The next verse after Acts 17:26, where Paul preached that, he said this. He appointed the nations their place and time that they would seek God, he says. That they would seek God. His plan is for the nations and the people and, and history to seek him. That's what he wants. And that's where the gospel comes in. And that's where God's people come in, like the guys today went out, to preach and to witness the unsearchable rich, riches of Christ. That's what our job is. It may be a new world Noah and his sons have entered into, but the same need exists as, as the, in the old world. No difference. It's, always, and it's the same today. Nothing's changed. People are sinners, and they need a Savior. We could be talking about India, as Chris Williams did last week. We could, talk, we could be talking about Honduras and the need there. We could be talking about France and the need there. We could be talking about America and the need here. Doesn't matter. All people everywhere need Christ. They need Christ. We're going to pick it up next week in Genesis 11. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're grateful again for your word. We're grateful that we could come together and Think through the scriptures. We just pray will help us to be people who think about the world, to think about the nations, to think about our, our, uh, uh, our activity and missions, and even here, to think about the, the, pe- the fact that people need Christ wherever they are in this world. Help us to have that burden for them. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.